Hi, everybody. Welcome to those supply chain lectures. I am Jean-Nes Vermorel, and today I will be presenting the quantitative supply chain in a nutshell. For those of you who are watching the stream live, um, you can ask your question at any point via the YouTube chat. I will not be reading the question during the lecture. However, at the very end of the lecture, I will go back to the chat and start with uh, from the question from the top and do my best from there. So let's proceed then. Um, so I will start with, uh, with a, a quote from one of the former French presidents, uh, hinting that there was like free path to ruin, that the quickest um, was with gambling, the most pleasant one was with women, but that the surest one was with technicians. And obviously, in, those, uh, in, the, in this series of lectures, we are opting for um, the third option. And um, I believe that, uh, obviously, it's, it's, uh, it's intended a bit as a joke, but that there is a, a grain of wisdom in this quote, is that um, technique, I would say techniques, is, um, is a powerful way to basically do more of a certain things, to be better at certain games. But it's also, it can also be quite distracting. And, um, and by technicians, I think that um, Georges Pompidou, he intended, by the way, uh, not only people, I would say, dealing with, I would say, the technical stuff, as in engineers. He also intended people who are dealing with, with uh, processes, with workflows, you know, the, more like the, the MBA type of uh, technicalities, the bureaucracies, if you want. And so um, when we tackle supply chain challenges, we have to be very mindful of whether, you know, um, the, what we are bringing to the table, does it really contribute to actually uh, addressing the core problems or is uh, or it's just, you know, a, a feel-good distraction as a way to basically have some inside the knowledge that the, that the others don't have, but as a way to exhibit skills rather than just deliver performance. So for today's lecture, I will be, unfortunately, I would say leaning a bit on the persuasion side. Um, you see, the, the challenge is that if you have a problem statement, you can prove that you have a solution that is superior for um, this very problem. It's possible. But can you prove that you have a superior kind of problem in the first place? That's, that's kind of that is, I would say, much more challenging intellectually. And, and, uh, and you see, one of the main criticisms that I brought you know, during um, the, the previous lecture is that supply chain is a wicked problem at its core. And thus, um, the way we have to look at it is, is, uh, is difficult. And one of the things that I will try to bring to the table today is to bring a set of requirements that I believe to be essential if we ever want to have any hope of delivering, I would say, something satisfying for supply chain. However, I can't really prove that any uh, of the elements that I'm bringing to the table is um, truly required. There is an, a an element of belief, and also there is an element of belief in, in, uh, um, in believing that the problem is correctly framed that way. Also, I believe that it's, it's not just belief, it's also high-level understanding. But there is also another element of belief, which is Unless you have a solution um, to, to pr you have a solution to present in front of your requirements, then basically all you have is kind of wishful thinking. Yes, it would be very very nice if we had a solution that could do this and that. But if you don't, then it's kind of a moot point. So I would ask you to kind of suspend your disbelief for one or two more lectures, um, so that we focus on the very nature of the problem and what would be, you know, the sort of element that are highly desirable for a solution to become even eligible to a good supply chain practice. So let's proceed then. You know, a few years back, um, uh, LOCAD had already, I would say, pioneered its relatively atypical way of serving its own clients. And uh, at the time, it was the, the end of 2016, I decided to consolidate a, a short series of, of salient points, of points that I believe diverge considerably from um, the mainstream supply chain theory, and to use um, those five points as a way to present how the, the quantitative supply chain um, uh, differs from the mainstream supply chain, if you want. 
I'm sorry, the, the, the terminology is a bit unfortunate because even the, the mainstream supply chain theory is also very much quantitative. But I decided to add, you know, another adjective to, to clarify a bit, you know, quantitative supply chain theory versus the mainstream supply chain theory. So those elements that I will be listing, they are not exactly foundational. You know, they are not the foundations. They are morely like um, a, a checklist of things we need to address if we want to have any, any hope to succeed. And what are those? Well, we have, first, we have all the possible futures. Um, we need to look at many, many futures, not just one future. Then we need to look at all the feasible decisions. All the, that's one, when I introduce, you know, the definition of supply chain as the mastery of optionality, that's those options, you know, those decisions are all the options that I'm referring about. And then the, the economic drivers, the idea that we are going to count the dollars of error, not the percent of error. And then the idea that robotization is actually an, a requirement for the management to be in control, which is kind of a paradox if you think about it, because you would think, oh, if it's robotized, I'm losing control. But uh, the proposition that I have for you is that it's the exact opposite. You need robotization if you want humans to be in control of anything, as far as supply chains are concerned. And then um, there should be, at the end of, of, you know, uh, of the practice, there should be one person that has the ownership of the numerical results, of the supply chain, of the quantitative performance of the supply chain. And this person, in the low CAD jargon, is um, the supply chain scientist. So let's, let's have a closer look at each one of those five points. First, the idea is that we need to look at all the possible futures. What do you mean by that? I mean, classically, I mean, first, why do we even need to look at the future in the first place? Um, we need to look at the future because everything takes time. Uh, we can't 3D print stuff, you know, not yet, not at scale, not, not without, you know. So, so, so it takes time to produce things. And then even if we could actually 3D print everything, we would still have to transport things unless people could have like 3D printers in their home. And, uh, and we don't have those, um, you know, um, super sophisticated 3D printers yet. And we don't certainly have, don't have, I would say, the, 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 the Star Trek style, you know, teleportation um, tech available. So basically everything takes time, which means that whenever you're taking a supply chain decision, for example, you decide to produce anything, to purchase anything, you do that because you're looking ahead and you anticipate a future state of the market where there will be some kind of demand for those products. And thus, you, walk, you, you, you do your way back and then you anticipate that you have that, so you're making a forecast of a kind, and then, uh, and then you can optimize your supply chain accordingly. So, there is, I would say, um, we, we need to have this, um, this look ahead. We need to have those, those forecasts, which are just you know, the, the mathematical flavor of, of the intuition. But then, uh, what kind of forecasts are we talking about? And I would say the, the forecasts that have been completely dominating um, the supply chain practice during the 20th century and the, the first part of the 21st century are, I would say, the, the classical time series forecast, which is profoundly flawed in my eyes in several ways. The first way is that the, the classical forecast, you know, you just take um, a time series, so it's data, you know, let's say sales aggregated per day, per week, per month, and then you, you have this time series and you project it into the future. You have your classical time series forecast. And I believe that this, this is, I would say, um, this is flawed. Uh, at literally at on the principle level because it completely this approach completely disregards the idea of uncertainty and my proposition for you is that uncertainty is completely irreducible um, and it's uh, literally whenever you're dealing with supply chains the future can never be forecasted uh, perfectly the idea that you can have like 99 percent forecast accuracy is nonsense I mean, even if, you, if you're looking at water consumption or electricity consumption, it is actually very, very challenging to achieve forecasts that have this degree of, uh, of, of accuracy. And, uh, and when you look at realistically at supply chains, and when you look at, for example, that um, a product in a store, that you're only going to sell you know, one unit a week for a given product in a given store. I mean, there is no hope to ever be able to, you know, to have like sub-percent accuracy. The question doesn't, do, it doesn't even make sense. So 
Uncertainty is irreducible, and if we wanted to have, I would say, yet a bigger proof of that, just look at the year 2020. I mean, we had like a massive worldwide pandemic, wrecking havoc all over the place uh, across supply chains. I mean, it's just not possible to, you know, to forecast those sort of things from a classical perspective where you, you have a number and you say, this is it, this is the future. So what you can have instead, uh, and that's exactly when I, what I'm saying when I'm uh, saying you know, all possible futures, is that you can have probabilistic forecasts. So the idea is that all the futures are possible, but they are just not equally probable. And that's the essence of probabilistic forecasting. It's the idea that you can have a, a statistical method that instead of pretending that you have the perfect forecast, that is exactly how things will be played out in the future, you just say, I have all those possible futures, some are more likely than others, and thus you embrace the irreducible uncertainty. And that's why uh, many of the situations where, where people tell me, oh, you, you can't forecast that. The answer is, yes, I can. It's just I cannot, I cannot give you, you know, a correct classical forecast, but I, I can certainly have, you know, a perfect probabilistic forecast. You know, the extreme example of that would be um, uh, lottery tickets. Um, you know, I know uh, I can establish, you know, for, for a lottery that what is the exact odds that any particular ticket is the winning ticket. I don't know which one is going to win, um, but unless, you know, if, if the game isn't rigged, I can have a perfect probabilistic forecast that just reflects the uniform probabilities for all the tickets. And that's exactly what a uh, probabilistic forecast means. It means that you embrace the fact that uh, although you know you cannot, you don't know the future perfectly. You know a lot about the future. You see, that's the thing: is that a probabilistic future. When we say we have probabilities, we know a lot of things. And for example, I can say that at any point of time, there is a tail risk that you have like a massive disruption of the market. I don't know exactly where the risk will be coming from. Maybe it will be a pandemic. Maybe it will be you know a stock uh, stock exchange crash. Maybe it will be a war. Maybe it will be, you know, a, a, a new a new tariff like the one that President Trump introduced. You know, it can be it can be many things that just disrupt your supply chain. And if I have to assess, you know, what is the tail risk uh, at any point of time for any supply chain? I mean, it, it's it's several percent uh, of having, you know, a massive drop for the next quarter. Again, it's not magic. Is that you? It's, it's just a very reasonable assumption to make about the future, and with the proper statistical tools, you can have something much more elaborate. Then, uh, all the areas that are uncertain requires a forecast, and a probabilistic forecast at that. Demand is not the only area where w that needs a forecast. For example, all the areas where you have uncertainties requires a forecast. So for example, that could be um, that you have to forecast future demand, but also future lead times. If you're operating an e-commerce, you can have future returns. If you're operating you know, um, something that depends on a, a primary production source like mining or you know, farms, you can have um, the uncertain production yield. Um, if you have um, stringent you know, uh, quality controls and you're dealing with biological processes or something, you, you can have, you know, probabilistic uh, uh, failure or, or probabilistic, I would say, scrap rate in your quality control if you're dealing with the repairs of parts. There are, I would say, a, a large variety of areas where you have uncertainty and all those areas deserve a forecast. So that would be, you know, part of a good supply chain practice is to embrace, you know, you need to think of all the possible futures with their respective probabilities, looking at all the things that need to be forecasted. It's not just demand. Um, and for example, we can even look at things like, uh, like um, uh, commodity prices. I mean, obviously, if you could accurately forecast the future price of, of a commodity, you would just play stock exchange and not run an actual supply chain. Yet, you know that certain commodities are much more volatile price-wise than others. And that's, th that you know. That means that the sort of class of risk that you have to, s that, that you carry when you deal with this sort of commodities uh, uh, can actually, you know, be optimized with the proper models by having those, um, those, those I would say, probabilistic forecasts in your, um, uh, in your arsenal of tools. Another element, and it's not just, you know, all possible futures, that all those possible futures, they are not 
independent. You know, they have strong dependencies. And that's also something where I would say the mainstream um, uh, supply chain theory is really lacking, is that they're looking at, uh, even when looking you know, at the demand forecast, as if this thing was completely independent from everything else that was happening in the supply chain. Um, you know, and, and even to this point of time, we still have frequently prospects that come to me and say, could Loka do a 12 month ahead forecast for this product? And, um, and let's say, for example, we are dealing with a sporting brand and they ask, you know, for this backpack, for this trek, trekking backpack, uh, can you forecast how much, you know, demand there will be on uh, during the next 12 months? And my basic answer is, it depends. It depends. I mean, if, if you are just selling one backpack, then maybe you will have this amount of demand. But if suddenly you decide to vastly, you know, inflate your assortment and introduce, you know, 10 more variants of the same backpack that have nearly, you know, the same price point, the same size, the same characteristics, plus or minus a few pockets and a few, you know, widgets. I mean, obviously, you're not going to multiply your demand by a factor of 10 just because you introduce 10 more products that are very similar. And yet, when we look at um, the classical forecasting perspective, um, there is nothing that would prevent, you know, the forecasting model from radically inflating the demand figures if you just, you know, increase the number of products to be forecasted. So that doesn't make sense, and that's why we have those futures. There are not only there is not only this irreducible uncertainty. We have also this, those dependencies that that exist between those futures. So we need to have tools that can, you know, apprehend all those changes. But then, as a concluding thoughts. Um, Forecasts are essential if we want to have any hope to optimize anything, just because we need to look ahead. But we need to keep in mind that they are just educated opinion about the future. They are not real. I mean, they are in the sense that the fact that your forecast is good or bad has, you know, uh, no direct consequences on your supply chain. And I know that there is many, therefore, in many companies, uh, people focus rather intensively on the idea of bettering the forecast. But my question is, to what end? And if you think that, um, that optimizing the forecast immediately translates into better, uh, uh, better supply chain performance, then my proposition for you is um, this is a delusion. This is not true, not even remotely true. Um, the only thing that are actually improving a supply chain are the things that have a tangible physical impact on the supply chain, which are the decisions. So what do I mean by, by decisions? Um, this is again a bit the low-cat terminology here. I mean things like if you decide to buy one more unit from anything from one of your supplier, that's a decision. If you decide to move one unit of stock from one location to another location, that's a decision. If you decide to raise your price for any product that you're selling, you know, um, upward, or if you decide to, you know, to decrease the price, this is a decision. So those things have a real tangible impact, and thus there are there are real consequences for um, uh, for the company. On the contrary, you know, I can have forecasts that fluctuate, that varies enormously from uh, one second to the next. I mean, all of that is is completely, you know. Um, forecasts are just educated opinions about the future. It's, it's better to have, I would say, um, to have a better opinion, of uh, a, a more fine-grained opinion about uh, what the future will look like. But the only things that really matters are the decisions. And thus, the, the proposition that I have for you is that um, a supply chain uh, practice should be completely oriented toward the generation of those decisions. This is the only thing that matters. And the idea that you can have something like a, a forecasting or a planning department, I believe, is to a large extent uh, misguided. Um, you should not have like a forecasting division. People, uh, again, the, the forecasts are only there to educate your guesses when it comes to take better decisions. So the only thing that matters are decisions. And I believe it's very dangerous and, 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 and misguided to separate the forecasting part from the, optimi from, from the optimization of the decisions. So, um, uh, so, and by the way, in terms of decisions, I mean, when I say feasible decisions, I mean that 
the decisions should be compliant with regards to all the physical constraints that you have in the supply chain. And in supply chain, you have, I would say, non-linearities all over the place. Um, for example, you can have, um, you can have like uh, MOQs, minimal order quantities. You can have um, maximal you know, shelf space in a store. Um, you can have you know, maximal volume or weight capacity in a container or in a truck. Um, you, you can have more subtle non-linearities such as expiration dates or, for example, the fact that uh, certain parts, let's say, um, for example, in aerospace comes with uh, flight hours and flight cycle and you need to do uh, repairs on, on a scheduled basis. Um, you can have um, all sorts of, I would say, of problems uh, such as, you know, some, some, some goods, for example, in fresh food cannot travel uh, in the same truck or not, or at least you need a special truck just because they can't be transported at the same temperature. So you either need, you know, multiple compartments or multiple trucks. So there are, there are plenty of constraints, you know, that limits what are the, the, the feasible decisions. And what do I mean by feasible decisions? Again, I'm, I'm pointing out this thing because um, it doesn't make sense to say that the perfect quantity that you should replenish to this store is um, 1.3 units of this product. This is not a feasible decision. It's going to be either one unit or two, but you can't have 1.3. So, so you need to have something that is really, you know, immediately actionable from a, from a really a, a very, very mundane perspective. That's what the feasibility refers, it refers to. So now if we look at um, every single decision, every phys feasible decisions, uh, we can look at all the possible futures, and the question is that how do we assess which decision is the good one? You know, and here we have to go to the economic drivers. So, the economic drivers is the idea that percentages of error doesn't matter; only dollars of error and reward matter. And um, and uh, simply put, I mean. There is this, this grand illusion that if you optimize percentages, you you will actually do any, you will do something good for your company. This is this is just not true. This is again, I believe this is deeply misguided. And if you want to have just one example of that, let's have a look, for example, at service levels. Uh, what does that mean to, to to have like super super high service level? I mean, frequently I hear uh, prospect that says. Can LOCAD deliver 99% service level? Well, we certainly can. You know, it, you just have to stockpile like crazy all the stock, and then you will have like crazy high uh, uh, service levels. But that's just that. You know, crazy. And why is it crazy? Because if you do that, you're going to generate you know immense um, uh, immense inventory write-off. So the profitability will be abysmal. So it's a trade-off. And it's not any kind of trade-off, it's an economic trade-off. You have, um, if we're, I'm looking at something very simple like service level, actually have a trade-off between the cost of inventory on one side and um, uh, the cost of uh, stock out on the other side. But so the idea is that if we, if, we, if we step back and we look at those economic drivers, for every single decision, we can assess you know, um, the outcome, we can take one decision, and then for one possible future, look at what is the outcome of, uh, of this decision for this particular future. And we can look at, um, at its outcomes in dollars by looking at the economic drivers. So what do I mean by economic drivers? I mean all the, the drivers that are shaping you know, the performance of your company. I mean the first circle of drivers is are, are very straightforward. It's things that, that you will find in the, uh, in the accounting books. It's like um, the, the cost of the materials, um, the, the selling price, if you do you know, uh, buy price, uh, sell price minus buy price, that gives you, you know, the, the gross margin. You have to take into account you know, the carrying cost and all the, the transportation costs, the transformation costs. You, know, you have to pile up all the costs. And, uh, and then you have your selling price and you subtract you know, all those costs from your selling price and you can have the, the gross margin. That would be the first circle of drivers, the one that are very obvious and where you can literally look it up in your ERP or your accounting software and you will find those costs. But um, those costs uh, uh, on their own, they are not sufficient. Usually if you just do that, 
you end up with a very short-sighted you know, financial perspective. You need to include um, the second circle of economic drivers, the one that do not exist in your system, not explicitly, usually. So what are those? They are uh, typically the second order effects of your supply chain decisions. For example, um, you don't, I mean, you, most of the time, if you have a stock out, there is no stock out penalty. I mean, maybe if you're, um, if you're a big brand selling to, um, to a large retail network like Walmart, maybe you have like a, a service level agreement and penalties if you do not hit certain targets. But, um, but usually, you know, this is, this is not very frequent. And even when you have penalties, it doesn't, those penalties, they don't necessarily reflect the real cost that you've actually inflicted on your clients. So the idea is that we need to have drivers that represent, you know, the second order consequences of, your, uh, 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 of what you're doing. And they can be both positive, such as, you know, generating uh, extra client loyalty, or negative, such as, for example, uh, generating, I would say, disloyalty and, and, and giving an incentive to your clients to just go um, elsewhere for another, for, uh, uh, looking for an alternative. Sometimes, and obviously, it's, it's very problem dependent. Um, for example, let's say if you're like a, a fashion brand, uh, when, for example, you're giving a discount, if you give, you know, at the end of the season, if you give $1 of discount uh, to a client, then actually it costs more. It co I mean, first, you've, you've just lost $1 of discount um, uh, because you've just given a discount, but then you're creating a habit for your client. So the client will expect the same discount next year. So you see, um, for example, if you're like a, a fashion brand, um, the discount, uh, you, there is, act there is the, the short term impact, which is what you've given away immediately. And then there is the long term impact, which is the sort of habits and expectations that you're building up among your customer base. And that's exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the economic drivers of the second cycle. So done right, and uh, I would say a financial optimization is not short-sighted. It's just that if you, if you just do, I would say, uh, a very naive financial optimization, then yes, you end up with uh, a lot of nonsense, but I guess you end up with a lot of nonsense with pretty much any kind of naive recipe, you know, as soon as you enter the, the, the world of supply chains in general. Now, the economic optimization is essential because um, the, the, without that, you don't even have a target for your optimization. Again, the idea of optimizing percentages do not work. You want to optimize dollars, and unless you have consolidated, in, uh, I would say, uh, under a single umbrella, all those dollars of reward and cost, uh, there is nothing to optimize, at least not in a, in a quantitative, from a quantitative perspective. And that's really what is of interest um, in this series of lecture. So, so we need to have those dollars, uh, otherwise we can't even, you know, start optimizing. And, uh, and my proposition for you is that if, unless, um, if your company has not started to have like um, a unified financial framework to drive its, its supply chain, optimization hasn't even started yet. And if you have like, uh, you know, dozens of teams dealing with percentages, um, dealing with service level and whatnot, this is an illusion. Of, uh, of performance, this is not real performance. Only dollars matters. Um, uh, dollars or euros, you know, <laughs> or yens. Uh, but, but you need like a monetary account. And then the, those economic drivers, they have another very important purpose that is usually, uh, that is frequently overlooked. So the first purpose is literally to drive the numerical optimization, you know, in a very mechanical way. The second, um, the second purpose of those drivers is to enable white boxing. Um, I will be getting back to this idea in a later lecture, but the idea is that for every single decision, we are going to look at all the possible futures, assign you know, the, 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 the economic performance of the decision, average out the economic performance of decisions, again, all the possible futures, and then we are going to sort all the decision from the one that has the highest ROI to the one that has, you know, um, the, the, so first the best decision with the best ROI, then the second best decision, third, etc., till infinity. Obviously, we want to stop making those decisions when we, when, we, when we break even, when there is no, you know, no profitability anymore. Uh, and, but the thing is, 
we need to have some kind of transparency. We need to have some kind of understanding with regard of why are we picking those decisions rather than other decisions. And here, those economic drivers prove themselves to be very invaluable because they can tell us the why that is behind any decision that is going to be generated you know, by our system slash practice slash you know, software at the end of the day. And the idea is that you will be able, with economic drivers, to look at every single decision and then have you know, half a dozen of, of KPIs expressed in dollars explain why this decision is actually a good one. And conversely, for a decision that is not taken, you can have a look at this decision and also look at the drivers and also assess and then get the why is it, it's not actually a good decision. Uh, and, and now I'm going to, to, and now I think we have, we have with the, those three building blocks, we have everything that it takes to basically start the practice. So we, we look at all possible features, we look at all possible decisions, every dec decision is challenge against all possible futures scored in dollars and we can rank them. So what do we need to, to, to make this thing real? And my answer is complete end-to-end -end robotization. And, and that's a bit of a product. The reason why you need complete end-to-end -end robotization is to basically bring back, to bring management back in control. And it may sound very odd at first because if you robotize, how do you get anybody in control? Well, again, it has to, it has very, it has to do with um, the, the, the nature of the supply chains that are very complex beasts. Supply chains are you know, distributed systems, many, many sites, many products, many clients, many, uh, many um, uh, software pieces, many people, may, uh, many vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, the whole thing is very complex. And if you do not, what is the alternative to have like um, a robotized process to generate all those decisions that need to be taken on a daily basis? Well, the alternative is to have what is commonly practiced, which is an army of clerks. And usually those, the, the, the favorite you know, tool um, uh, for this army of clerks is going to be you know, a sea, an ocean of spreadsheets. And here lies the problem is that if you're if you're managing you know, an army of clerks, whenever you want to, to change anything in your supply chain, it takes six months for the change to sink in because you will have to, to deal with many, many people that you will have to retrain, and then you will have to check that they really understand you know, um, the, 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 new, the new strategy, the new rules, and everything. And, and so um, you are invariably you know, six months late to any battle just through sheer inertia of um, caused by the fact that um, you have a pretty big ship to, to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to pilot. And so robotization is the idea that if you can, put, if you can actually implement an end-to-end -end numerical recipe that generate all those mundane decisions. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about all the mundane decisions again. I'm not talking about decisions such as um, should we, you know, start a new plant in a country or should you actually open up a new country for the company? I mean, those decisions, you don't take those decisions on a daily basis. You, you, you take them, you know, a few times a year and it's, it's very much okay to have a lot of people, you know, thinking about them. But for every single skew that, that you have in your supply chain, um, you have half a dozen of decisions that needs to be made every single day. Should I actually produce more? Should I bring more? Should I displace the stock that I have somewhere else? Should I move the price up or down? Should I actually even get rid of this stock that is serving no purpose at all and that is just you know, taking space in my warehouse or my store? So, uh, and again, even deciding to do nothing, so if you have like a skew and you decide to do nothing particular today, it's already a decision. So uh, again, that's decision 101. The lack of decision is already a decision in itself. So if so, uh, and considering the scale uh, at which you know modern supply chain operate, I, my belief is that one need I would say end-to-end robotization -end if we want to have any hope to be agile. And then there is also another very important angle, which is it's very important to have like end-to-end -end robotization. Um, if we ever want to have something that is, that is capitalistic and accretive. Um, this will be the topic of, my, of the next lecture uh, after this one.
but, uh, but just the, the short version is that you do not want to treat your supply chain division as, uh, as OPEX. You want to, to, to treat your supply chain investment as CAPEX. So you want all the efforts that you're pushing on supply chain should be accretive. And, um, and you want to, to, to make of supply chain uh, a capitalistic, uh, I would say, asset of the company. And the only way to do it is again through robotization because otherwise it's, it, the, the opposite of that is just an army of clerks where you will have to repay those people every single day so that they can do the same thing over and over and over. Um, which brings me to the question that, okay, if there is like a robotization, there is some kind probably of, of software in sh that is actually doing the, the clerical work in place of an army of, of, of clerks. Who should be in charge of that? Who should be responsible for you know, those numerical recipes? Who should take ownership of those results? And, and here, I think the, the classical answer, which is, oh, we have a system. The system is responsible for that. I believe that's, that's, a, that's, that's again, a very misguided answer. A software, a piece of software, even if it's a very expensive piece of enterprise software, is never responsible for anything. You know, it's not, it's not self-aware. We are not, you know, despite what people might say about AI, we are, not, we are, nowhere, we are nowhere there yet. Um, right now, what we have is glorified fancy numerical recipes. And by the way, they are, it's good. It can already deliver tons of value for your company, but what we have is fancy numerical recipes. So somebody in your company needs, um, or in your company or outside of your company, need to take ownership in the quality of those numerical results that are going to drive uh, in a very mundane fashion your supply chain. And um, the way, the practice that we have pioneered at LOCAD is the idea of the supply chain scientist. Um, the supply chain scientist, it's, it's basically, it was a concept that was born from my early failures when I was attempting to you know, address the problem with data scientists. The problem with the data scientist is that your commitment lies in the technicalities. And remember you know, the first quote about the surest way to win is with technicians. And that's exactly my perspective nowadays when, when basically pay, people tell me about data scientists trying to solve supply chain problems. Uh, that's, the, 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 that's a very short path, absolutely. Um, very short in the sense that there is very little uncertainty on where you're, go where you're actually heading, not that you will have actually have great results at the end of the journey. And so the supply chain scientist is literally, uh, is literally the person who is going to you know, take ownership on generating actually real world decisions. And then this person has to you know, pay attention to the most minute details of your supply chain. Um, for example, if one warehouses, uh, one of your warehouses was flooded last year and that for three weeks you didn't have any, anything flowing through that warehouse and it's completely garbaging, garbaging the seasonality profile, you, you can't dismiss that as, oh, well, I, I don't really care about the problem. You know, it's, 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 um, it's just a detail. You know, it doesn't challenge the core validity of, of, the, uh, of the mathematical model. The supply chain scientist perspective is, yes, it does. If I end up taking like stupid decision for this warehouse because I had an accident, an operational accident in the past that introduced, you know, severe biases in my historical data, it matters. All of that matters whatever you know generate dollars of reward or dollars of cost matter and that's and by the way if we look at this illustration with you know uh, two types of scholars uh, here we have obviously you know uh, india jones who by the way is supposed to be a scholar and researcher and wins uh, for the terry patchett fans you know i believe that literally it's two types of scholars but the reality of, of those two ca fictitious characters cannot be um, uh, more profoundly different. And I believe that, the, yeah. at, I would say, at a fundamental level, the difference, it, it pretty much reflects the difference between a supply chain scientist and uh, a data scientist. And by the way, as, an, as a litmus test, you, you can ask yourself, does the CEO care? I mean, is, is literally um, the CEO of the company going to challenge you as the supply chain scientist on what you're doing? In my own experience of, again, 
uh, uh, running low cat for over a decade is that nowadays I am meeting with the, the CEOs of my and the boards of my clients on uh, regularly, and usually they challenge me on you know the, the fundamentals on the supply chain and how are we actually bringing you know dollars of return for their supply chain. The, the discussion does not lie around do you use support vector machines or gradient booster trees. Those are not the question that I'm being uh, that I'm being asked. The, the question uh, are, are literally. Um, uh, what are you know the the path that ensures you know that the supply chain is uh, a very valuable asset that it's that it can you know um, that can, can really you know overcompete the, the the rest of the market. Now, I I did present you know five points and they are they are requirements you know they are not the actual solution to the problem they are just a list of elements that I believe that if they are not properly addressed then it doesn't even qualify. You've, you've not even really started to work on anything that would be meaningfully improving, you know, optimizing the supply chain, at least not in a quantitative fashion. You, you, you have plenty of non-quantitative optimization. You know, uh, uh, if you have like better equipment, you can have uh, better po hiring policies, you can have, you know, uh, giving, you know, financial incentives that are well thought to, to, to your teams, etc. There, there are plenty of other ways to approach the problems. But, um, so that uh, list of requirements. And by the way, um, there is the full detailed plan of the upcoming lectures that are on the LOCAD website. So it's uh, locat.com slash lectures. And, uh, and we'll have to cover quite uh, a lot of things, you know, different perspective, different concepts. We'll have to, obviously, this will have to be richly illustrated. We need to introduce a lot of paradigms, especially of the programming type, uh, methods, tools, practices. I mean, there is literally tons of things. But all those things are introduced in order to, among many other things, to basically check the marks on the list of the five points that I've just presented. And without that, uh, well, it's just, uh, it, it's just not flying. Now, to bounce back a bit on the tangent, um, a lot of people, they change me about, oh, you are presenting a vision that is so different from what we are doing today. You know, um, this is so advanced in a way that we're not there yet, we are going to take it slow and, and, and do, do our things and, and improve a little and then, and then maybe, you know, once we are better, we will, we will have another look at, uh, at this quantitative supply chain thing. And, and again, I believe that there is this, this um, crawl, walk, run, what I call the crawl, walk, run fallacy. The idea that you can, you know, incrementally progress on many things. I mean, progress usually is completely non-incremental. It's, uh, it's not, it's just not. Um, uh, when basically Amazon decided that they will start to, you know, be a cloud computing provider, they went from uh, uh, basically selling books online to, which was already quite innovative at the time, to basically sell cloud, uh, computing resources in a way that is completely on demand, that is nowadays known as cloud computing. You see, it, it wasn't the sort of nice, gentle, you know, step-by-step -step progress. It, it's very disruptive. And same thing, you know, there is this very famous quote from uh, Henry Ford, which is, if I had, you know, ha asked my clients what I should do, um, uh, my clients would have told me, you should work on, on, on building faster horses. Um, and, and obviously, it doesn't work. Um, so the idea is that what I challenge is that if uh, if we if you if you're willing to accept for a second that you know that th what I've listed are requirements and that most companies haven't even started to look at the problem from the right perspective, then basically and that's typically our starting point with most of our clients is that nobody has any maturity, almost nobody, and thus. Uh, it's a bit an illusion to think that there are the big guys out there that have some maturity. It's not because you have some gigantic company that has, uh, you know, an SNOP division with 500 people optimizing the wrong metrics that this counts as any degree of maturity. In my book, it's not. It's just that it's a, it's a fantastically rich company, fantastically successful for reasons that are completely, I would say, orthogonal to supply chain performance. 
and um, and um, and thus it, it doesn't count as maturity. So so I would say um, that would be my message for the audience is that don't consider yourself as being immature just because you're not doing what uh, many other companies are doing, especially with regard of their size of their respective bureaucracies. Uh, from my perspective, it says very, very little. And, um, and the, the companies that I see as having, I would say, the most maturity nowadays are typically fairly small North American e-commerce that are incredibly agile and digital. And they don't necessarily have, you know, massive, um, you know, teams of, da of data scientists. They just have, you know, um, a few people with the right mindset and the right type of numerical recipes. So, uh, um, in conclusion, you know, I've pretty much covered things that are, I would say, on the necessity side of the problem. Uh, we will be, in the next lecture, start to look at things that are on the sufficiency side of the problem. So things are, what is the, our problem statement? What is, uh, what is on the side of the solution? But again, I need to start with what is on the, on the problem statement side of the affair because otherwise I don't even know if the solution that I'm bringing to the table is actually you know, um, uh, uh, something of value or just like most solution, a solution you know, in quest for a problem. So thank you very much for, uh, for your time today. And, uh, and now I will actually have a look at the questions. Give me a second. Okay. Um, so uh, yes, um, I'm very sorry for the five minutes delay. We had some, uh, some uh, glitches with regard to the sound. So I will, but, uh, but let's say it's just uh, me being French. You know, French people are always you know, five to 10 minutes late. No, just kidding. We'll try to be a bit uh, more on time next, ne next week. So um, uh, from Carl Eric Deau, I, I enjoyed the subtle Dune reference. Yes, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very cool book. And that's, you know, it's uh, the main characters are actually a series of characters has the ability to look at all the possible futures. And it literally, uh, when you're capable of doing that, that gives you literally absolute um, martial superiority over your enemies. And, uh, and I believe that it's the, the metaphor is pretty much apt when it comes to supply chain. If you can look at all the possible futures, even if you, if you don't exactly know which one, just knowing what is the landscape of the possible just gives you, I would say, a massive edge against competitors who are just looking at one future and they say, this is it. And uh, while there is a near certainty that it's not going to be correct, it's, it's going to be something different. Now, um, would you please elaborate a, a, a question from NR? Would you please elaborate more about uh, the second order drivers? Um, so when I say second order, I am, I'm talking, I'm taking the angle of the second order in the sense of second order consequences when you're dealing with humans. You know, you're dealing with uh, smart systems. I mean, uh, supply chain, you, you cannot think of your supply chain as a system as if it was, you know, um, uh, 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 a physical system of three particles, each one having trajectories and bouncing back on obstacle in a perfectly you know, predictable manner. It, it, it doesn't work that way. I mean, people can adapt. Uh, and literally, you're dealing with people. Um, just to give you, you know, an ex just another anecdote on that. At one time in the past at LOCAD, we had one client where we were actually suggesting you know, uh, purchase order quantities. And um, we were looking at the purchase orders that were actually passed. And usually, um, the client was ending up passing massively inflated figures compared to what we had recommended. So it was, it was very, very odd. We were saying, you should reorder 100. And then the client was reordering 200. And then people were telling us, no, no, no. We, we, we didn't modify you know, su suggestion. We passed uh, 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 100 units as an order, just as you told us. What was happening was that actually when on, on the reception side, so when the client was actually receiving the goods, the teams that were in charge of reception, they would have to recount to make sure that basically there, there was like the initial order, 100 units, do, do, have we received 100 units? And if uh, on, on recount, they were, 
it was the quantity that they had received was not matching the quantity they had ordered, their systems had a very peculiar, peculiar limitation. It could either, you know, um, either they could, you know, uh, send back, uh, so basically they would cancel the whole purchase order and send back the whole merchandise. But by doing so, they would put their whole production line in jeopardy, or they could modify the original purchase order to, pre to make it as if the initial order, purchase order, was actually matching the quantities they had actually received. And, and, and because people knew that if they didn't you know, take the quantity in, they would put the production in jeopardy, what were they doing was they were actually you know, changing the quantity of the original purchase order so that it matched the quantity being received. And what had happened over the years? Well, suppliers are not idiots. Suppliers, you know, some smart suppliers, you know, had discovered on their own this very interesting property of their ERP. And now, when they were nearing the end of the quarter and they didn't have achieved, you know, their target, some suppliers knew that they could literally push whatever they want to this client and that the client would take it anyway and pay, uh, and pay the, 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 the invoice happily. Uh, no question asked and no complaint. So obviously, that's the sort of situations where you have like a, what I call a second order effect. You have like a seemingly trivial, um, mundane aspect of your ERP, but then you have like smart humans in the, in the loop, and those people, you know, they just, they just game the system. And this is happening, you know, whenever you're dealing with humans, um, uh, people can think, you know, and they will react and adjust to whatever you do. And that's the idea is, that's what the second order is about. It's all the, the consequences of the consequences. And the idea, when I say second order, actually it's, it could be the nth order. You, so you know, you have to think, what are the consequence of the consequence of the consequence of the consequence? I know it's a very tough game to be played. Intellectually, it's, it's, it's very, very challenging. But just look at the other, uh, at the alternative. If you don't take into account, you know, the second order consequences, uh, you end up with pretty stupid moves, pretty much all the time. So now, about those, uh, more specifically, those second order uh, drivers, uh, and the second order economic drivers, it means that you have to put dollars on that. It's very tricky, it's very tricky. I mean, it's, and, and here, the idea is, it's okay to be approximately correct. You don't have to be, you know, super precise. It's, it's okay, it's better to be approximately correct rather than to be exactly wrong. And, um, and to have something that is just in the ballpark of, of having something that makes sense is just good. You don't need to have something very precise. And in any case, even something fairly crude is going to trump something that is just blind. So, um, okay, so, um, Rishikesh uh, Go Palakrishnan. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. What are the techniques used in complete robotization? Ah, plenty, 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 plenty. And, uh, um, and that's exactly what the next lectures where I will be introducing programming paradigms will be about. I mean, obviously this is software we are talking about, but what kind of software and what are the, the core design properties that are most desirable to achieve this this robotization. And, um, and here, uh, I'm not going you know, to, 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 to do in advance uh, the, the next lectures, but the idea is that what you really want is, um, is not AI. First and foremost, what you want is something that is production grade. You want something that has, that produce, you cannot have like 0% forecasting error. That's, that's not possible. But what you can have is 0% insanity. So literally the key question is, if I want to have end-to-end um, -end robotization, I need software that delivers 0% insanity. What, what do I mean by insanity? Something that would just you know, blow up your whole, can, your, your whole can, company. By the way, if you want to look, there is like a Wikipedia, Wikipedia pages, I believe, on the Target Canada that literally disappeared, went bankrupt due to, uh, I would say, <laughs> Uh, supply chain optimization gone completely insane, and uh, and there was also the, the Nike disaster of 2004, where uh, Nike, one of the most valued brand, uh, you know, worldwide, almost went bust due to a complete insane um, supply chain software that was, by the way, a competitor of low cap. 
Um, so, so first, that's, that's what we will do. But by the way, this will be covered in the next lecture. It, it will take us a bit of time to get there. Now, in your forecasting uh, so uh, a question from Salman Alem. In your forecasting ta talk, uh, if we try to encompass so many probabilistic variables, we would need to develop models ourselves, and it may become, and then becomes simulations. Any thoughts? Uh, I mean, you see, there is no clear difference between um, something that would be, you know, accurate, an accurate simulation of the future and a probabilistic forecast. You know, this is, those are two different flavors of numerical recipes of how can you actually apprehend uh, the future. And um, by the way, um, the, the idea is that whenever you have like a probabilistic forecast, um, uh, a probabilistic forecasting model, you can literally generate what I call, you know, trajectories that represent the future. All you have to do is you, you take your probabilities, you just draw a deviate, and then that becomes your fictitious observation. You relearn your model, you rebuild your probabilities, and you iterate. I know I'm, I'm, very, I'm very, very synthetic, but, um, but by the way, um, I believe that when you go into relatively, I would say, um, uh, models that are actually suitable for um, supply chain purposes, the distinction between simulation and statistical modeling becomes exceedingly thin. I mean, those two things just, uh, to, to a large extent, they completely overlap. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, another question from Dervish Javl. Again, I'm very sorry for mispronouncing your, uh, your name. Thanks for the session, uh, and, and yes, and thanks for tuning in again. Um, are the solution evolved at LOCAD, uh, at, uh, that, that you developed at LOCAD based uh, um, are service-based or a combination of both? Uh, what is your opinion on this approach for the future of supply chain? Um, so look at, just to understand a bit our perspective. My perspective was um, we want to, uh, to basically um, deliver, you know, ultimately supply chain performance expressed in dollars. And now, and that would be, you know, the topic for the next lecture, by the way, um, there is, uh, I, I would say, uh, an insane amount of, of complexity in this, in this domain. And I, I believe that m just like uncertainty is irreducible on, uh, I would say, on, on the forecasting side, the, the complexity is just uh, irreducible, I especially if you try to have a software product that tackles all problems at once. So you need to have like a meta solution for the problem. And the, the approach taken at LOCAD is um, first, it was to acknowledge that we need human intelligence. So we need those supply chain scientists. That's, there is just no alternative. I mean, it's just, I believe it is, it is folly uh, to think that AI can, you know, comprehend the challenge of a modern supply chain. It's way beyond whatever, you know, e e whatever uh, any AI team can do, even if, if we're talking of the teams at Google, you know, or Facebook. So, so we need human intelligence, but then we need to have something where those smart people, those experienced people, those people who have acquired the right skills can be very, very effective at their jobs. And so they need, so look at, we have developed a product, but it was, the, the, the thinking was whatever it takes to make those supply chain scientists very pro, uh, be very productive and be exceedingly reliable in what they do. That's, 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 that's the nature of the thinking, you know, can you provide the right tools for the supply chain scientists? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, very long story short, um, uh, Python is not the solution and it will become gradually clearer as we move forward those, those lectures. You will see that there is like profound problems where most of the generic programming languages have uh, problems, design problems that make them terminally unsuited for, to, to address Supply chain, uh, supply chain problems in a satisfying manner. But we'll have to get into the fine print because there is a lot of finesse here in what do I mean by production grade uh, and, and the production gradiness of the solution. Remember that's the zero percent insanity we want because as long as you have like an insane robot that just you know, do a lot of crap for your supply chain, it, it just cannot work. So that's, that's, that's what we need to, to address first. 
Okay, another question on uh, Alexei uh, Tikhonov. Often quantitative approaches require us to quantify what was not quantified yet or what was sitting in Excel spreadsheets, not in ERP systems. What is the most efficient way to deal with this problem? How can this additional inform uh, information be gathered so that it can be as reliable as information from the ERP systems? Absolutely, and I would say here you have two very distinct problems. One is, um, uh, I would say, the, the statu quo where, um, you know, the problem with those, those dollars of reward and error is that politically it's very, very tough. I would not sugarcoat it, it's very, very tough. A lot of people have very strong incentives in any large organization to never discuss dollars of returns or reward because otherwise, the company at large would just realize that they are just, you know, a cog in a bureaucracy, and they, they are added literally. They have zero added value for the company. So, so first, there are a lot of things that are not quantified, just because they are like strong, you know, ambient political forces uh, that are playing against that. And just to give you one example, um, to make it more concrete, uh, when uh, when Locad we started, for example, years ago, to work for a retail network. So we want to optimize the, the stock in stores. We quickly realized that the stock in stores was, service, was actually fulfilling two radically different purposes. The first purpose was to actually service the clients properly, um, and, and thus you need a certain amount of stock. The other purpose was um, to, for the store to look completely plenty so that it doesn't look like, you know, Sovietic Poland with uh, bare shells, with, a little, with, with, near, with shells that are half empty. So you need to have the store that looks like to be overflowing with goods so that it's very, very appealing. Obviously, you don't need all this stock from a pure servicing perspective. So we had a quantity of stock expressed in euro uh, for this large retailer, and we say, well, in terms of cost, you know, there should be something like half of the stock, which is really needed for servicing purposes, that should be carried by supply chain. The other half, which is only needed, I mean, not only, but that is needed for merchandising perspective, for, for merchandising purposes, it, it should be the responsibility of marketing because those euro, they could decide to spend those euro on TV ads instead. I mean, it's uh, their job to have like the good, to, to make the good investment so that they can generate the most demand. But, uh, and you see, obviously, marketing, who suddenly was in the position of having, you know, a massive inventory, uh, inventory line entering the budget, they were not happy. They were, they, were, uh, they were literally dead against this very idea. So you see, so first um, uh, ab about that, we have, we, we have first to address frontally the fact that it's very tough and that playing by the rules, we need to establish the rules that we are going to play by those dollars of reward and cost and that the rules will apply to everybody alike. That's very, very difficult. So that's the first thing. And indeed, those things are completely absent from the system. But most importantly, frequently, a lot of people in the organization have a vetted interest so that those things remain that way. And then we have um, another sort of problems, which is actually much easier to address, which is just shadow ITs, sh shadow IT. And here, um, again, um, the, the problem with ERPs and, and this sort of software, and you can look up uh, the, the local knowledge base on, on ERPs, is that for ERP vendors, it's very, very difficult to cover all the situations. Um, for example, you, you might have MOQs. You might think something as simple as, let's say, supplier MOQs. How do you represent that in, uh, in an ERP? Well, it really depends. The EMOQ, the EOQ can be, you know, when you pass an order to this supplier, you have a minimal, uh, you have a, a minimal order quantity uh, at the at the product level. So you need to order at least 100 units. Or the MOQ might be at the order level. So whenever you pass an order to supplier, the order in total for many products need to reach this quantity. Or sometimes you have co a combination of both. You need to have a minimal quantity per product and at the order level. Or it can be uh, something even more complicated. For example, in textile, uh, people would say, you can order whatever you want, but for every color that you order, it needs to be at least 3,000 meters of fabric. 
So obviously, you have certain garments that are using you know, a color. Some garments are using multiple colors. And whatever you order, for every, order, for every color that is present in your order, it needs to be at least 3,000 meters worth of fabric. So you see, the problem is uh, with, um, with all this information is that um, for the ERP vendor, it's just mind-blowingly difficult to represent all of that. And as a result, uh, you buy an ERP, and, you, and this ERP does not let you represent all the things that you, that you would like to represent. And here, and so people invariably fall back to their Excel spreadsheets. Um, here, I believe that's, that's precisely the role of a good you know, um, uh, IT department, is to be able to you know, build and deliver the missing bits so that this shadow IT doesn't remain shadow IT, but just remains you know, small extra bits of, uh, of in-house extension. I mean, in a sense, it's just good to have like a, an ERP, and my advice is don't customize your ERP. Just do something on the side. It's, uh, it's way easier to maintain rather than taking a super complicated product and just, you know, um, uh, and go going all the Frankenstein way on top of, uh, of the ERP. Okay, um, so I guess no further question, it seems. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for watching, and uh, see you next time. Next lecture will be next Wednesday, same day, same time. See you soon. Bye-bye.